Inflation has risen steeply over the last couple of years. Is this just the beginning or has it peaked? Depending on how you answer those questions, should you now be tilting your portfolio toward those asset classes that have tended to survive or even thrive during periods of elevated inflation? Or have you missed the boat on that and now should be thinking about doing just the opposite? And what are those specific asset classes that have tended to outperform during each of those phases? Stay tuned as Roshan and Adrian discuss all this and more right now on the Retirement Lifestyle Show. Welcome to the Retirement Lifestyle Show. I'm your co-host, Roshan Langani. Here this week, we're going back to Adrian and I doing this together. Eric is not with us. Uh, Adrian, how's, how's your week been so far? Everything's been good. Uh, the week's been a little bit busy, but just trying to just stay as busy as possible, just take care of everything that I need to do, just hang out with some of my friends too this week and maybe see my family over the weekend. So I'm looking forward to this week. Can't, can't really complain too much, especially since the weather is also getting warmer too means I get to go out a little bit more. So everything's looking more positive. How have you, how have you been, Roshan? It's good to have you back on the Retirement Lifestyle Show. Yeah, good to be back. Last week, spent some time at, a, uh, at Jamestown and then at a water park with the kids. So uh, I was really looking forward to uh, getting, getting back to the office and getting back to the podcast. Yeah, I understand that. That was like one of the first ever field trips I did at school was Jamestown. I can can't really hardly remember it, but that was always the go-to place and uh, the go-to first field trip. So, yeah, that's that's yeah. cool though. How was the water park any yeah. fun? Uh, it was. It it was fun. The kids had a great time. My daughter uh, Ava was studying Jamestown in school, so it was her idea. She wanted to go there. Okay, that's really cool. So, yeah. So that's. I mean, that's awesome that you got to spend some time with your family. That's always good this time of year. Yes, 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 it was. We've got a great topic for today. Are you ready to jump jump into it? Yeah, of course. I'm always ready to go. So uh, today we're going to be talking about uh, inflation, popular, popular topic in the markets, some areas to look for investments in that space when you're considering inflation as well, and uh, give you some of our thoughts. We are licensed, so we've always got to give the... Uh, the disclaimer that we're not recommending anything. Before we actually jump into the investment side of inflation, uh, Adrian, if you don't mind, I'd like to talk a little bit about this uh, this term that you're probably starting to see, which is peak inflation, meaning that we've hit the top and things will turn uh, start turning down. I think that's an important place to start, just because um, uh, just because um, it would. If you believe we're there, some of these investments we talk about just wouldn't make sense. You would have missed the boat, missed the opportunity. If you think inflation will continue, there may be some uh, some opportunity for you in that in that space. So I was thinking we could talk a little bit about that first and then get into the investments. How do you feel about that, Adrian? Yeah, that's a great idea to kind of talk about is inflation peaking or not. It kind of brings up the concept of timing where it's really hard to time the market. And this is another kind of term or area p- investors are looking at, trying to time inflation, just depending on what asset classes they should be looking at or investing in. Just being able to time inflation would be very valuable, just considering the type of investments that do well in an inflationary environment or the assets that do the opposite I, is very, is something people have to look at and timing it is something that's really difficult. And if this is something that people think is going to be around for a long time, it will definitely change the dynamics of their portfolio. If this is something that's just a blip, it's only going to be here for a little while. That's, that's just another story. So I th- it's a great way to start the episode off Roshan. Yep. And, and that's what the, the Fed's dealing with. Is it temporary or is it permanent? So uh, this whole concept of peak inflation, um, uh, earlier this week, UBS came out and they said that um, they're calling it the peak after the readings come out, but they're predicting it. They, they, their, their data, they believe, is telling them that. 
but there's no way to know if that's accurate. A couple uh, data points on what the Fed's expecting and planning on is uh, they're actually expecting inflation to slow down to 4.3 this year uh, by the end of the year and then drop to 2.3 by the end of 2024. So they're expecting inflation to be uh, under control really in, in just you know, a little over you know, re- a little over two years. So they're expecting uh, it to kind of be half of what it is now. Is that kind of what they're aiming at? Excellent question. Right where, right where I'm headed. They kind of. The reason I say kind of is because, and this is what makes inflation so confusing uh, when, you're, when you're looking at it, is you've got to look at what data source they're starting with. Uh, with this whole peak inflation conversation, and well, I'm sorry, and by data source I mean what inflation number are they looking at? So, when you're looking at where we are and where they expect it to be, the the peak inflation to go back down to to 4.3. This is based on something called the uh, uh, PCE price barometer. That's a that's a data source public by the published by the Bureau of Economic Analysis. That's surprising. And I thought that, you were going to say the Consumer Price Index because that's the most one of the more popular indicators when it comes to inflation, just the goods and services people are paying for and just measuring that out as a way to see where inflation's headed. Yeah, and it, it's important to note, note, note the difference because the... Um, starting point that you have is is different as well so right when you so it, it's not quite cutting it in half and i had the exact number in front of me on that i'm going to pull that back up uh to, to say where we're starting and i'll tell you exactly where we are so pce number from february is 6.4 so just need to note that we're not going at the eight as a starting point. It's at 6.4. And then the question becomes, well, why is this lower? It's the, the core PCE index does not include, um, uh, it's, it's, it's the personal consumption expenditure prices, but it excludes uh, food and energy. So whenever we talk about these, food and energy are a big driver. People are definitely paying more for gas at the pump and food prices have gone up. They exclude it from this one because they think the volatility is high on there so that um, uh, so they want to find the more core spending of the um, of the consumer. So it's a little more narrow measure. It has not gone up as much, but we're still uh, it's still at six point four now. And expect it to go down by the Fed to to uh, to four point three. Yeah, that's a really good data point. Uh, just something that people need to consider, or what probably the Fed is looking at, or what are going to be the lasting effects for inflation. The inflation can decrease over time, but there are still going to be some lasting effects, or maybe some areas of the economy or different sectors where it's still it's still going to be an issue. If you think about just for commodities, for instance, commodities that really don't have any substitutes, for example, like oil is something that is may not change with everything else if things are pulling back in prices. So that's something that people should really look at and just monitor as well. Just what are going to be some of the lasting things or what what are you going to see some improvements on? I think is is really important where you have to kind where you have to stay up to date on this. I yeah, definitely need to watch this and monitor this in particular when you're talking about um, investing, right? Because uh, when you're talking about investing, uh, a lot of times like there's an old uh, saying, old investment saying that says. Uh, buy the rumor, sell the news. I'm not necessarily advocating for that or not, but the point being is, is it too late? When the news is out, is it too late? And as I was analyzing and researching some of this, we'll go over different asset class and different investments uh, that we've reviewed, but I do question whether 
it's too late or not with some of these, which makes me less inclined to spend my research time there. Yeah, and just right, the reason so, why this topic is so concerning for some people is just investors purchasing power. Are their assets now going to increase over time? Are they going to be able to buy more with their assets? Or are they going to lose out to inflation, especially the more conservative pieces of their portfolio or the positions or investments that they have that don't do well in this type of environment? So this is why people are This is why inflation is just being talked about so much because people just want to see, do they need to reposition? Do they need to adjust where they're currently at right now? And that's why we're just having this conversation with you today, our listeners, just to see if there's other avenues, if there's something that is going to continue, what you should do if there's something that won't really continue. It's just looking at the different aspects of it is just extremely important so you don't lose out on future purchasing power. Yep, you you want to make sure you protect it yourself. Uh, and from the purchasing power, as you said, and my concern really, and, and why I keep getting back to, uh, is it too late? Is I want to make sure that if uh, you do look into this theme, you go into it very cautiously, just because there uh, there there's a possibility that that. If the Fed's right, if things will get back down to normal, the another uh, popular, famous Wall Street uh, saying is, you know, don't fight the Fed. But if, if they're right and you think things are going to uh, get back, get back to where they were, it, it, it you really got to be cautious and, and you know, quite frankly, throw out a lot of the different areas we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about things that are typical for inflation, where people look to invest. Some of those you'll look at it and say, well, I, I just don't want to spend my time researching that by my belief. A couple other data points just before we get started is that uh, currently the central bank's target is to, to get the Fed funds rate, the short term rate from where it is now, which is the quarter point to half point neighborhood up to 2.8 by the end of 2023. So we've got uh, they've got a meeting next month where uh, in in March where the expectation right now is it to jump a half a point and they usually do this a quarter point as a, at a time. I've seen multiple things that say the markets have priced in six more rate hikes uh, this year. All that being said, if the target is is to get to and I'm gonna round up to three just because we're looking at a half a point to quarter point hikes. Um, you're going from a quarter 0.25 to half percent all the way up to three, uh, roughly. So you've got 2.5 percent to go in there. That could be a total of 10 because they tep- typically do them in quarter point increments to half point increments. So there's another argument to people that people have that are currently bullish on um, the stock market at the moment, which is that uh, the market's over uh, expectations on the rate hikes they've overstated the expectation. They might not be as fast, not necessarily taking a position on that, but just another valuable data point as we go into these asset classes and investments. Now, Adrian, I've got a list of a, of a few areas that are up there. I'm sure there's overlap on our list. So I'm just going to ask you to start. What is an area you looked into or researched uh, where you see people could spend their time seeing if there's an opportunity? The uh, one that the top of my list would be the Treasury Inflation Protected Security. The acronym is TIPS, what some investors refer them refer to them as. It's just a security or a bond that just provides protection against inflation, where the principle of Treasury Inflation Protected Securities moves with inflation or decreases with deflation. So it's just a, a way to hedge and kind of move where inflation is other than just getting locked into a fixed rate where this adjusts depending on what the environment is right now. Now, there are a couple ways to get exposure to this. What did you look at and where do you see the opportunity here? This is actually one of my favorites uh, as well. So for those of you researching, as I'll keep going back to, so. Uh, Kari can approve this for us to put out there. Uh, we're not recommending anything. We are giving, we're trying to help you find areas where you can research to, to make investment decisions on. 
So when you looked at the at the uh, Treasury Inflation Protected Securities, which I'm a fan of as well, did you look at the uh, ETF or fund space, or did you look at going to um, uh, going to uh, you know, Treasury Direct and buying these directly? Well, I think that the point that you brought up is just really valuable for our listeners because there are just multiple ways for you to invest in Treasury Inflation Protected Securities. There are ETFs out there. You can buy them directly. The website is treasurydirect.gov. Uh, I, you could also uh, buy them within your 401k as well. So there's many avenues and areas where you could, there's a lot of options out there for you to invest in this space, which is very beneficial, where you'd have to do your research, look into it, have a conversation to see what's going to fit best. And they have different maturity dates as well for five to 10 to 30 years. So there's definitely a lot of options that could that could fit your needs as an investor. Yeah, so let's go a little bit deeper in this. I'll just uh, distinguish between the two and then talk about the uh, buying them uh, directly a little bit more. You can buy exchange traded funds um, for these treasury inflation protected securities or mutual funds out there, but you want to be cautious on it because those funds, you're buying bonds that the fund already owns. Right. And when you're looking at what's gone on so far in 2022, we're recording this on April 13th. At the moment, if you went to buy the treasure, the the ETF that gives you exposure to this, it's actually down this year of 5.34 percent. So somebody looking at that uh, at that and um, where it is would say, well, how are inflation protected securities losing money when inflation's up? It's because there's a difference between buying them directly and buying them in a fund. When you buy them in a fund, you're buying what currently is in the portfolio. So you've got some bonds that they bought, you know, five, ten years ago that um, that have lost a little bit of of a value along the way. What you have to ask yourself, or just look into and research again, when it comes to these two types of bonds that we're talking about, is is inflation going to be here for a while? Or is it not going to be? And that's just something you really have to consider when you're looking at these individual investments because they, some of them do perform really well if, infla- if inflation's here to stay for a while. But if it's not, it'll be, the, it'll be the opposite end. So again, that's what you have to really look at and just see how you're going to allocate this if this is going to be a portion of your portfolio. If this is going to be kind of a, a hedge that you're going to rely on, it's, cause it's going to be extremely important when it comes to the allocation aspect of it. Yeah. And, and um, going back to what I had said earlier, getting it via a fund versus getting it directly is very different. So make sure you look into those options and see what makes sense for you. Going back a step further to what we talked about at the beginning, if you believe that uh, in this peak inflation conversation and that things will will pull back down, it will very much change your outlook and where you look to um, invest. Yeah, and just uh, the limit too on how much you can invest in for an I-bond versus TIPS is a it's a it's a big difference because of the type of return you're getting from i bonds versus treasury inflation protected security so just again when you're looking at i bonds the uh what you mentioned you're you're capped at ten thousand dollars and there's also uh you can buy an additional five thousand using your tax refund as well i thought that was interesting when i found that in my research as well where tips you can invest a lot more compared to i bonds so Again, that's where you have to consider how much of a big role or impact it's going to really have in your portfolio, depending on where you're at. That is that is for sure. Uh, what other investments did you look into or what other opportunities did you see that are worth discussing? Well, a big one that people are looking at are commodities now, because that's a very big uh, area that inflation can impact. And like I mentioned before, some commodities that have substitutes where you can use alternatives to the product in your process, whatever type of business or whatever sector you're in, might not be feeling the impacts of inflation compared to a a commodity that really there are no substitutes out there. And again, the biggest thing with commodities too is they really have, uh, their correlation isn't 
the same as equities or bonds or other aspects of it where they don't really move the same they're different depending on what the environment is so this is something people also want to have a conversation about to see how this could be a part of their portfolio if the conversation of inflation is here to stay or not this is something that people are looking at to see if this is going to be something beneficial for their overall plan yes and commodities are another one on the list that, that I have, they have gone up a lot this year. One of the uh, indexes are up over 31% this calendar year alone. They're one of the few areas where things have uh, gone up and done uh, done well in this current market environment. So that's the, the other uh, issue and concern. There's been a lot of talk this year about how um, nickel uh, has, has gone crazy uh, and you know, shot up, shot back, shot back down. So be careful in this space, especially if you're looking at the conversation we had about bonds, investing directly versus in the fund. If you look at commodities and try to trade futures or something like that, it's, it, they, they include leverage, which makes it very, very risky. And uh, then the question is, how much of this is temporary versus permanent? There are a lot of people out there. I recently heard them talk about a commodity super cycle, and they're saying things have just started. And on the other side, I've heard um, talk of this is temporary just with what's what's gone on in the uh, markets. It, part of that inflation will slow things down. And so uh, I don't I don't necessarily have any specific side on, on that. I would just say be careful, uh, be careful investing in this space. Yeah, um, especially when it comes to future contracts with commodities. I've heard of a story where if you uh, if the contract goes against you, they could be dumping like bushels of wheat in your front yard and you need to find out a place to store it or people buying like these empty pools to put barrels of their gasoline in there just for storage and their oil. So you could, it's a, definitely a more advanced area when it comes to doing your research and getting into the commodity space, but then there's alternative routes like ETFs that are a little bit more easier for the investors. So there's definitely some interesting takes out there when it comes to this space that I found interesting when I was looking up this topic. Yeah. Another thing worth noting too, is we're giving you ideas of what to look into is um, uh, position sizing is also important when you're dealing with some of these riskier, riskier assets, right? Making sure you just don't have too much in um, in one space or anything like that. Yeah, of course, that's a really good point. Just diversifying and just seeing what where you should properly allocate and just make, and monitoring that throughout and just seeing where you can adjust. It's a great point, Roshan. Yep, and uh, Adrian, I'll, I'll go on to the next one. What have, what have you got next on the list? I'll let you uh, bring up one of your points if that's okay. Yeah, well, here's the two that I'm gonna talk about together just because I think this is a very interesting conversation um, and give some numbers on it. But gold is up this year about 10%. That's often used as a store of value. Bitcoin, on the other hand, is down about 15% this year at the moment. And I bring them up together because an argument for Bitcoin uh, enthusiasts in the past has been that this will replace gold as a store of value but the volatility in it has um, more and more seemed to line up with the, the uh, stock markets. So I wonder if that conversation has, has uh, changed at all from the enthusiasts. We should probably talk, um, uh, talk to Jeremy and, and see if he has a, he has a thought on, on that at the moment. But I, I think talking about them together because uh, the story about gold and being someplace to, to be in this inflationary environment seems to be holding up. Whereas that uh, argument for Bitcoin or that view of Bitcoin, at least in, in 2022 so far, seems to have lost a little bit of steam. Yeah, that's an interesting take. And just also like a big proponent of cryptocurrency is just adoption. Are people going to be using this as well? Or is it going to be more of, a, like you mentioned, a store of value? What's going to be the actual use case in this? current inflationary environment this market environment is kind of it is one of its tests that it's going through right now to see how how will 
the value go up and down? How will it change? Where gold, which has been around a lot longer than cryptocurrency, has more of a track record. So in this type of environment, people might view it as a more a safer or conservative play versus cryptocurrency, which doesn't really have that battlefield test that's gone through this environment. But again, that's just something that could change day to day. That's something that you'd have to really watch out for because, again, the conversation a couple months back was this is going to be a good store value. It's really good. Um, like different areas that are experiencing high impacts of inflation, cryptocurrency was a very valuable um, aspect of it. So it's just another test just to see how, how it will do. Yep. It, it will, and as this continues, it'll be interesting because uh, only time will tell the accuracy of this whole um, peak inflation uh, conversation. If that if that is right or not, and then how the impact will be on the store of value conversation is also going to uh, we're going to see that play out over time. I'm going to go on to another another two. I'm going to combine these as well because. Um, it's it's stocks in general or a stock and, and bond portfolio both both of which are are down I, I think we we discussed adrian and i discussed talking a little bit less about this because we have so many so many um podcasts directed at, at the uh at the stock markets but it's it's definitely worth noting they say it's, it's a great place for inflation uh stocks and bond portfolio as i said is down and the s 500 also also down this year um i'm a still believer long term in that story that it's a good place for inflation but uh for investing in times of inflation the question is really twofold here one is will it continue we've mentioned that question many times but the second thing also worth noting is that um historically when the fed raises rates in the long run stocks have been fine but if they go at it at an aggressive pace, stocks do initially take a hit. It seems like it'll be pretty aggressive. And the stocks that take a hit the worst are those growth stocks. So uh, in summary, I believe in the long-term story, there are definitely um, opportunities out there, but, uh, right, but it, it's, worth, it's worth noting that the stock stocks, I feel like you can sort of always be hunting in um, in the stock space. The, and I mentioned the S and P is down about seven. The growth part of the the S and P, the S and P core growth, is down around thirteen. So you are seeing growth stocks taking a bigger a bigger hit. Yeah, and just interest rates in general are going to be just something people are going to be watching. Is the I mean the term that people use is I, the Fed is being right now very hawkish. But over time, as they increase interest rates, depending on what inflation does, do they start pulling back more? And then the term is, are, do they become more dovish? Is going to really not dictate the market, but it's just going to be a factor on individual companies. Like we said, companies that rely more on financing, leveraging, and don't have earnings compared to companies that have strong balance sheets, strong cash flow is going to be something that people are going to be watching when it comes to individual stocks in their portfolios and just the market in general is going to be a big factor. And then bonds, of course, interest rates are just one the driving factor when it comes to this as well. And then just bringing us back to one of the first points we looked at, this is why people are looking at investments such as treasury inflation protected securities, I bonds, stuff that will, that will move with inflation is one of the key factors here. Yep. Yeah. And I'll keep going on the list unless you want to, uh, to jump out or, you know what, I'll keep going and you tell me if there are things that I missed it. Well, let's end. talk about real uh, estate. Just, That's gotta be a big one, I guess right now, as it's just been going up and up. Home prices have been going up. Mortgage rates too are going up as well. And it's been a really good way to keep place with inf inflation, don't you think, Roshan? Just the way how's, how home prices have been going up. Yeah, Adrian, I was saving this for the last because I just think it's the most complicated right now. Um, and uh, but let's what let's makes it so complicated it we'll though? If home prices are going up, you're beating out inflation big time. All right, so here here's what makes it complicated. First, how do you invest? 
right? If you go into either public or, or if you go into public REITs, the index is down 5% this year. If you go into REITs focused on income, public ones again, it's also down around 12%, right? So the first complicated part is how do you invest in it? There are definitely private, private investment funds out there as well that'll give you the income and you don't have to deal with the public market volatility. Uh, but that's one. And then two is if you're buying real estate directly, you've got the uh, mortgage rates going up, which typically puts downward pressure on pricing. So are you, are you quote unquote, too late for that party? Uh, I personally don't think you are if you're looking at long term and you're looking at um, yeah, being in the D.C. metro area. That's the kind of market I monitor the most, you know, these, these uh, more urban areas. So if you're looking long term into these kind of areas, if you're buying a property that you're going to rent, uh, rent and, and you know, just trying to look at it purely as an investment, I think if you're patient and find the right property, there's definitely an opportunity there. But what makes it complicated uh, is first, how do you invest in it? And you know, if you're buying the property, how do you invest in it? I was going to say, because you've got the public stuff that are easy to get in and out of, lower transaction costs than buying a property directly, but then you are subject to the market volatility, or you can go buy the property directly. If you plan to sell, you'll deal with the volatility. You've got to go out and get that get that mortgage, you've got to get the renter. So you take on a lot of a lot of the management uh, there. What I do think is changing in that market is a year ago, I was talking to clients who were losing out on bids where properties were going hundreds of thousands over asking. Whereas now I'm not hearing that so much. I would still say it's a seller's market. You've still got a bit of a supply and demand imbalance in the favor of the seller, but um, nowhere near where it was where they're, where they're um, uh, getting these bids going way above the offer. Anecdotally, I've just not heard those stories stories recently. But once again, looking at it purely as an investment, I think if you if you find the right property where you can rent to a cash flow at the very least even to positive space, I think in the long run you'll be okay. Uh, you know, I feel the same way about uh, if we going back to what we talked about stocks. I mean, I don't know what's gonna what tomorrow is going to bring with an up or a down day, but I do feel like there are some opportunities out there, and we have seen some some uh, stocks specifically in that growth space that are down huge right now. Yeah, they are. But, and also just the tax implications, they gotta be, I gotta imagine that it's more tax efficient to be investing in real estate versus stocks. I mean, that's a generalization, but when it comes to uh, real estate, isn't? do you think it's more tax efficient, just depending on how you handle it versus other investments uh, in people's portfolio? Yeah, I mean, real estate investing is is a is definitely a good place when you consider taxes. Mm -hmm. That's for sure. Yeah. So yeah, I I, I think you are right on uh, with that as well. That that you're that when you include taxes, you're it it makes another stronger stronger case for real estate. So yes, I I do agree with because I I gotta imagine just given what inflation's been doing and just kind of cutting away people's purchasing power just being tax efficient more than ever is just extremely important because it's kind of like a, a lose-lose situation if you're paying a lot in taxes and you're losing a lot of your purchasing power due to inflation where just people are looking at just so many spaces now where they can just allocate their portfolio just to stay as diversified as possible in all different areas where so I, it's just just something that people are just constantly just having to stay up to date on because it's just changing so rapidly i feel like yep you've definitely got to monitor that and watch it it is it is more management if you buy the property but you can always get a manager to uh to take care of that work for you it'll eat, eat into your profits but it might be the the better thing for your peace of mind i've seen that with clients where uh just the stress of being a landlord was was uh too much for them and then they got rid of the property that that would have been a good long-term investment and it might have been the better move to just get a property manager uh so in addition to the real estate i've got just a couple other things i think are worth mentioning 
Uh, and then I've got something I'd want to wrap it up with, Adrian, but I'm going to uh, um, let you direct that a little bit as well. The first thing, short-term bonds and cash, I'm coupling those together because especially in inflationary times, you say, well, my cash is losing to inflation. Uh, and similar conversation with short-term bonds losing to inflation. True, but in this environment where most investments, uh, most areas you look in are down, uh, they're not losing right now and they may provide you that dry powder to find an investment later. So it's, it's something just worth considering. I know we're talking about inflation and in general, you would say that's blasphemous to talk about cash in an inflation episode. I will concede this is not an inflationary move. This is more of if you think it'll continue and you think the Fed's going to be a, a very aggressive with their rate hikes, well, then a lot of the uh, uh, investments will decline in value and that cash will not, giving you the opportunity to... Uh, to buy later. Yeah, opportunity, like you just said, is just really key with your your cash. Is I guess the concept that we keep throwing out is just monitor, monitor, where it's more important than ever if you have cash on hand to be monitoring this just to see where you will deploy it next so you're ahead of the curve. So I'm definitely with you on that. And then one final one on my list um, is uh, levered loans or floating rate loans. These are uh, loans adjust based on interest rate environments. So they do a lot better than um, longer term bonds. Um, like the floating rate space, once again, this is just one of the indexes that are available, is down about 1.4% uh, year to date. When you compare that to um, the core bond index being down about 7% year to date. So they are down, um, but they're not down as much. They they will adjust what what interest, the interest being paid on these loans will adjust, and it should catch up sooner as well. Uh, Adrian, that's my my list. We covered pretty much everything that I that I had. Are there any items we missed on areas for people to look or research for their potential investment ideas. We covered a lot of different asset classes and just different ways you can hedge against inflation. I think they were all good areas. We could just have an episode on each one. Like you said, the, they can, you could really do a deep dive on all these areas just to see if they're a good addition to your portfolio or if you should just keep them out for the time being and just wait for another market cycle or a different environment to come up. They're, always things you should just revisit constantly just to give you more opportunity, more diversification and greater flexibility, just having the options out there. I mean, as planners, our job is to show you all the options that are out there, give you the data so you can just make the best decision possible. Yep, completely agree with what you just, what you just said. I wanna add one thing in closing, which is the markets, the markets are, are, are down and just going through this list and preparing, aside from gold and commodities, everything else we mentioned were down. Bitcoin, stock, bond, composite portfolio, uh, S&P 500, public REITs, uh, uh, where you're looking at either income-driven or growth-driven, growth levered loans, the publicly traded tips, uh, short-term bonds, and the other one that, that isn't losing in dollars, but is losing purchasing power is cash. So when you look at this list and you say, okay, cash, commodities, and gold, or the, and, and your gold argues subcategory of commodities, those are the only things that are, uh, are up this year. So what do, you, what do you do as an investor, especially people who've only experienced the pandemic-driven market decline where you had the fastest decline and fastest recovery um, in history? What I would tell, what I would say to those people is look for where the investment opportunities are for the long term. And if you're a long term investor, what's going on right now in the market is not at all abnormal. So try not to look at the day to day in the short term. And if you think long term as an investor in the uh, short term, the market is a gamble. You're not going to know which way it's going to go up. 
but in the long term, it is an investment that will that will do well. And I keep referring to the market as in the stock market, but I think this applies to to most most of the things that we've discussed on the list. If you're investing for the long term, uh, it 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 usually will work out better in your favor than than trying to jump from what's hot now to the next to the next thing. Which is why when we had this topic, I wanted to discuss this peak inflation theory at the beginning because if you're if you're looking at this and you're saying well only those three items are up if peak inflation is accurate well those items that are those areas that are up are very very there they could be down later especially if it's short term and, and you could just miss the boat so we're providing you areas to look into i also want to uh talk a little bit about your mentality and what you're looking for and just say thinking long term will prob- will more than likely prove profitable for you. Yeah, it's a great way to wrap up the episode, Roshan. Yep. Yeah, excellent. And uh, for everyone out there, as we always say, thank you very much for for joining us. Thanks for spending your time with us. We appreciate it. We hope you found it helpful and gave you some ideas for what to look into. Please like subscribe, give us five stars, tell your friends and family about us, check out the website, retirementlifestyleshow.com, and we will be back next week with a new exciting topic.